Hello, everybody. We're going to go in here to some of the biliary tract disorders, and this is meant to complement um, some of the other videos, such as the surgical disorders of the liver, uh, acute gallbladder. Uh, I go into a lot of things in those that I'm not going to cover here. So this is kind of ancillary stuff, uh, but a couple of these are super, super high yield for your exam. Others um, they're high yield, but you don't need to know as much about them, and I'll explain what those are in a little bit. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right-hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos, and I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely subscribe to my channel, and you'll get notifications every time I put a new video up. All right, so this is what we're going to talk about. The big one here is PSC. I'll spend the most time talking about that. Here's your anatomy. You should be familiar with this. You know, if you don't know this basic anatomy, you're in a lot of trouble as a physician. You don't need to know anatomy as deeply as you did for step one, but you still need to know your basic anatomy. All right, so we're going to start with PSC. So PSC, we don't really know what causes it. It's probably immunogenic, uh, but it is inflammatory. It causes sclerosis, and therefore it's going to cause blockage, i.e. obstructive jaundice. And you should know your symptoms of obstructive jaundice and how that can differ both on labs and on symptomatology compared to hepatocellular jaundice. Very important that you know the difference because that will narrow your differential diagnosis. They are not the same. Okay, so with PSC, you probably already know there's a big association with IBD, particularly with ulcerative colitis. 50 to 80% of PSC patients also have inflammatory bowel disease. However, just because somebody has inflammatory bowel disease does not necessarily mean that they're going to uh, develop PSC. Only about half to 4% of people with ulcerative colitis will have PSC or develop PSC. There is a male preponderance, which is unusual for autoimmune disorders. There's not many that do that. Ankylosing spondylitis is another one. You know, but the big autoimmune disorders like lupus and RA and, and uh, autoimmune hepatitis, uh, those have a much bigger female pre uh, preponderance. The presentation, most of these patients are asymptomatic, but if they do develop symptoms, it's going to be those that we associate with obstructive jaundice, um, such as, of course, jaundice. Um, they can have acolic stools. Um, it does depend on the severity, of course, but a lot of these patients are asymptomatic. Further, the symptoms can remit and relapse. Now, the diagnosis is MRCP. Why do we do MRCP and not ERCP? The reason is because there's inflammation. Inflammation, when it, wherever there's inflammation, the structure that's inflamed is weaker. And so naturally, we do not want to inject stuff into a duct that we don't know how weak it is because we can cause perforation. Um, and then you're in a whole world of hurt. So uh, we do MRCP. It's safer. Uh, and you can make the diagnosis that way. The labs, you should already know that when you have an obstructive picture, you're going to have elevated ELKFAS and GGT. You may also have elevated transaminases, but not as dramatic. Uh, P. anca is associated with uh, sclerosing cholangitis, and that, that's important to know. You can also see it associated with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Here's your normal biliary tract. Now, I am going to point out the anatomy here because if you get a picture, it will likely look something like this. Okay, so what do we have here? So here you have the right hepatic duct, and here you have the left hepatic duct, and that's easy to know because it's in the liver, okay? So then this will join together and form the common hepatic duct. And then once that joins with the cystic duct, which we don't, it's kind of hard to see here, but it's actually right there, uh, then what we have is the common bile duct. Now we can see here the pancreatic duct, our pancreas is right here. Um, so this is the pancreatic duct here, kind of coming in like that. And that joins with the common bile duct very, very close to the ampulla of Vater. Um, so actually right here. 
And then that's going to drain into the second part or the descending part of the duodenum. And then what we have here is just the endoscope. Now this is, again, normal. Uh, what you don't see here is a cystic duct or a gallbladder. You can see the staples here. This patient had a cholecystectomy. So here is PSC. You can see, obviously, lots of areas of sclerosis as well as areas of dilation, and that should be common sense to you. If you have sclerosis in one area, then proximal to that, you're going to have dilation. So these are not cholecystocal cysts. That's important for you to know uh, because uh, you have areas of stricture. The treatment is supportive. Steroids and immunosuppressants are only indicated when there's overlapping autoimmune hepatitis, but that happens fairly frequently. So if you have a patient with PSC, you want to work them up for autoimmune hepatitis because there is treatment for that. It's not going to touch the PSC, but it would delay um, end-stage liver disease for patients who do also have autoimmune hepatitis, and the treatment is quite different. Um, it would be steroids and anti-TNF drugs. For pruritus, we can give bioacid sequestrants. Where do we also give that? For high cholesterol, and the reason is because it reduces the reabsorption of bile. Um, the liver then has to make new bile, uses cholesterol to do that, and thus reduces your cholesterol. Pretty nifty. Number of complications from PSC, including an increased risk of cholangiocarcinoma, which I talk about in the liver talk. Here is your uh, comparison with PBC, primary biliary cholangitis, formerly known as primary biliary cirrhosis, and autoimmune hepatitis. Okay, benign biliary stricture, usually iatrogenic from surgical procedures. Um, so these are patients that may have gotten an ERCP in the past. Maybe they had some sort of surgery uh, on the bile ducts. Uh, so look for that in the history if you get this on an exam. Uh, the presentation ranges. Uh, most patients have no symptoms, um, but uh, if they do have symptoms, it's likely going to be um, obstructive jaundice uh, like picture or they can even develop acute ascending cholangitis and you may see the stricture there. there. Best initial diagnostic step if they do have symptoms is a right upper quadrant ultrasound. We always do that if we think there's a problem with the biliary tract, if there's ever right upper quadrant pain and what you would see is a stricture. However, it can be difficult to diagnose that so what you would do then is an ERCP. The labs will show an obstructive picture, ALP and GGT, as opposed to the transaminases. The treatment here, like most strictures, is going to be a dilatation or uh, a stent placement, especially if they've had repeated episodes. So here you can see the stricture, very obvious there. And this is a really severe stricture, and so consequently you see some dilatation of the proximal duct. All right, let's go over some cancers. So carcinoma of the gallbladder is the most common cancer of the biliary tract. 90% of these patients have a history of cholelithiasis. I should have probably put that in yellow. That will come up on, uh, on, if you do get a test question on this, expect to get that information. There is also an association with aflatoxin. Um, that comes from uh, moldy uh, produce. And the important thing there is that the USMLE loves to test the associations between cancers and carcinogens. Um, so very important to know that association. These patients rarely have specific symptoms, uh, and that's a problem. That is a problem with any cancer, because if you don't develop symptoms until you have metastasis, you're in trouble as opposed to some other cancers that may give you symptoms right away, that makes it much more treatable. Uh, abdominal x-ray could show the porcelain gallbladder, and I'm gonna show you pictures of that. That is probably the biggest association that gets tested, so very important to know that. Right upper quadrant ultrasound may show stones, often do because these patients often have a history of cholelithiasis, uh, but no acute cholecystitis. That is not an association with gallbladder cancer. 
Uh, so like I said, by the time it's discovered, it's usually spread. Only 20% of patients are surgical candidates. The treatment is going to be to remove the gallbladder, of course, and often we need to take uh, some lymph nodes out. And that's um, not only to remove the cancer uh, if it's spread, but also to stage. Okay, here's the porcelain gallbladder. This is calcification of the gallbladder wall. If this ever happens, you have to take the gallbladder out. So if you did an abdominal x-ray for something like a bowel obstruction and you saw a, a, a gallbladder that looks like this where there's calcification, you must take the gallbladder out. That is, after you treat whatever is going on, these patients need to be sent in for a gallbladder uh, removal and then you're going to biopsy anything that looks suspicious there. Okay, so here's some other pictures. You can see this is very straightforward. Cholangiocarcinoma, I talk about the liver section, so I'm not going to go into that. Most cholangiocarcinomas occur at the confluence of the right and left hepatic ducts. That's called a Klatskin's tumor and makes up about 80% of cholangiocarcinomas. Ampullary carcinoma is pretty uncommon, but this is a cancer at the ampulla of Vauder. Um, so as you probably can already suspect, we don't need to do ERCP for that because we can visualize the ampulla of Vauder with ordinary EGD. So the most accurate test is EGD with biopsy. However, if they do have symptoms, and they commonly do, uh, then you're going to do an ultrasound because usually the symptoms are an obstructive jaundice uh, or right upper quadrant pain, but big time the jaundice. Okay, so anytime you have jaundice, you need to visualize the biliary tract and your best initial step to do that is an ultrasound. Uh, also note that anytime there's a tumor in the biliary tract you have, and you get obstruction, that obstruction occurs very quickly as opposed to if you have stones where the obstruction occurs. Well, you can do, get an obstruction that occurs quickly, but often these patients will have some obstruction for a period of time, uh, such as if they have biliary colic, and that allows the, uh, the gallbladder to fibrose as opposed to a tumor where you don't have the time to fibrose, and so there's a lot more compliance of the gallbladder, and that's going to lead to a big dilation of the gallbladder, and it could even be palpable. And so if you have a painless palpable gallbladder in the setting of jaundice, i.e. obstruction, that's called Quavassier sign, and that means that you have a cancer somewhere, most likely, at least a tumor. Uh, and so there's a lot of overlap here between ampullary cancer and pancreatic cancer. However, the big difference is that with ampullary cancer, they tend to present earlier on in the course, and that's a good thing. The treatment here is Whipple's procedure, and that's just like pancreatic cancer. Here's a normal duodenal papilla. Note that it kind of looks like a polyp, but you can see the uh, opening there, and you know where the duodenal papilla is. It's in the descending part of the duodenum. And so you're not thinking polyp if you see something there. Okay, here's a mass. This is obviously abnormal. Um, you can't really see the, the opening and that that would cause the obstruction. Uh, but you, again, know where the ampulla is. So if you see a mass there, you know you need to biopsy it. Okay, let's finish up with cholidocal cysts. So you don't need to know a whole lot about cholidocal cysts. I put this there for your information, but you don't need to know all the different types. This is a congenital malformation of the biliary ductal system. It is different from congenital biliary atresia where you can see a similar pattern. Um, I'm not gonna say most present in the first year of life, but they often do. Um, and so if you have a small child with a an obstructive jaundice picture, that's a big problem. If you got a little baby with unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia jaundice, that is probably the uh, jaundice of infancy, uh, which is super common and very benign. Uh, however, if you see jaundice in an older infant or in a small child, then you really need to be thinking of cholidocal cysts. Symptoms, intermittent jaundice, possibly pain, right upper quadrant mass, but only a third present with the triad. If you see a child or an adult who has intermittent jaundice and they have no stones, they have no Quavassier sign, 
um, then consider getting an ERCP, but often we can note this on ultrasound. And that's, of course, going to be our first test anytime we have a patient with right upper quadrant pain or jaundice. The treatment here is just surgical correction. Uh, however, if they have liver failure, um, then you need to do a liver transplant. I circled four here because this one can be deadly. So here's some pictures. You might get a picture on your exam, uh, but uh, it behooves you to know the anatomy, which I already went over. Okay, so that's all I've got for you. Uh, if you haven't watched my liver talk, if you haven't watched my acute gallbladder talk, please go back and watch that uh, because I don't cover everything that has to do with the biliary tract here, um, just some ancillary stuff. So please go back and watch that if you haven't already.